Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of This Week in the World of Football. This is episode number 252 for July 12th, 2022. I'm your host, Randy Snow. On today's show, quarterback Baker Mayfield is traded to the Carolina Panthers, and it's sayonara to Aloha Stadium in Hawaii. In this week's history lesson, we tell the story of the only NFL commissioner to actually play pro football. But I'm not here by myself. Across the table from me, as always, is my son, Adam. Hey, what a lovely, gorgeous day it's been. Oh, it's beautiful out there. It's been so nice lately. And, not too uh, hot, not too Yeah, I mean, cold. July has been pretty good so far. Yeah. Nothing crazy yet, but yep. we're also in the midst of uh, losing some football leagues, and some are about to wind down some more before we get to... Yep. And we got preseason games in a month. Can you believe that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not far away. And uh, we've, we've got some more... Uh, uh, Championship games played yeah. in Canton, Ohio, we're going to talk about here in a yeah. too. All right. We come to you each week from the world of football, Man Cave, located right here in the center of the football world. That'd be Kalamazoo, Michigan. We're here to promote the game of football in all its many forms, past, present, and future. Our goal is to educate, inform, and entertain our listeners with the glorious buffet that is the world of football, while keeping a close eye on the rich history of the game. Thanks for checking out our podcast. We'd love to get your feedback on one of our many platforms, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and YouTube, where we post the entire audio portion of this show, as well as other selected videos. So let's begin today's show with Adam and the World of Football scoreboard. That's right. It is week five in the Canadian Football League season, and oh boy, uh, I love me some CFL football. Some mm. great highlights this week. Yes. Uh and we're going to start off with Thursday night. It was the Calgary Stampeders who put on a clinic against the Edmonton Elks yeah. <laughs> uh, with the final score being 49-6. to six. So those poor, poor Edmonton Elks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this was the Battle of Alberta. The Stampeders improved to 4-0 on the season behind rookie running back Peyton Logan, who scored his first career CFL touchdown on a 122-yard return of a missed field goal. What a highlight yeah, that was. it sure was. I, I saw that highlight, and he's like, you know, their their end zones are 20 yards deep, and he's like right yeah. in the middle of that 20-yard end zone, and he just picks it uh, picks it up, and he just started running. I thought, oh, my God, is he going to is he gonna go all the way? And, man, did he go. <laughs> that yeah. was an awesome highlight. And that'll be a heck of a highlight for him to, for the rest of his career. Yes. Be, being your first touchdown, it, that's yeah. pretty special. <laughs> yeah. uh, then on top of that, you know, uh, Stampeders receiver Malik Henry caught six passes for 150 yards. Good day for him, yep. including an 89-yard touchdown. So Yeah, it helps when you have one play for 89 yards and yeah. you get 150 on the game. It looks real good on that stat sheet. <laughs> uh, then Cal Calgary's defense had two interceptions, three sacks, and two fumble recoveries, and one of those fumbles was returned for 63 yards and a touchdown by linebacker Cameron Judge. It was just all Stampeders. Oh, yeah. There were so many great highlights from this game. I was almost going to call this the, the highlight package of the week, but there was a game that was even yeah. better than this one. So. And, and for a game that was so one-sided, I mean, to yeah. have all those highlights. But, yeah, and... there was still a lot of good highlights. I mean, uh, you know, offense, defense, special teams, yeah. uh, uh uh, t- touchdowns and, and great plays, but I, you know, the, the plays kind of went back and forth. Uh, Edmonton had some good plays too, but it, they just, man, they just could not find the end zone. Yeah, uh, two field goals was all they managed. It's, it's really rough, and for Edmonton, you know, that they haven't been able to, you know, get together more than one win on the season, and yep. boy, losing in that kind of fashion's really got to be demoralizing. Yeah. Yep. All right, we're going to move on to Friday night. We had a game between the Saskatchewan Rough Riders and the Ottawa Red Blacks which saw the Rough Riders get the 28-13 victory. Saskatchewan running back Frankie Hickson had a 63-yard touchdown run in the second quarter. And then, uh, well, uh, some yeah, some bad some news. Some bad news, <laughs> as yesterday Saskatchewan's uh, defensive lineman Garrett Marino received a four-game suspension from the league for, an, uh, for his in-game behavior. Marino received a one-game suspension for an illegal and reckless tackle on uh, Red Black's offensive lineman during the game. A two-game suspension for, quote, dangerous and reckless low hit, unquote, on Red Blacks quarterback Jeremiah Masoli, for which Marino was ejected from the game, and another one-game suspension for verbal comments about Masoli's heritage after the game. Man, I can't understand. I, I don't know why anybody would do that. Yeah. You know, you've already you know, uh, shown what an awful person you are, and now, now he's bad-mouthing the guy's uh, 
ethnic heritage. Oh my gosh! Yeah, and then Jeremiah Masoli uh, had then had to be carried off the field at that point and could miss ten to twelve weeks with that injury. Um, and then Marino's suspension is currently the longest in-game suspension in CFL history. Uh, wow! For yeah, it, for a league that I I can't even. Well, I think there was one time we saw a player get what a, like a one or two game suspension for a really vicious hit. Um, in like the opening game of the season, I remember watching yes, Simone Lawrence. Uh, okay, years ago for the Tiger. Yeah, Cats. for the Tiger Cats. Yeah, I remember yeah. that. Yep. Uh, yeah, it was it was very. very I remember vicious. watching that. And he game. was and he was not apologetic yeah. for it either. Uh, and he got you know, a couple games suspension. And I think two games is is usually the the most you can get, and that's why they gave him three different penalties uh, or three different suspensions, so they could uh, make it four games altogether. Um, and, and on the highlight package, they did show the hit on the quarterback. Mm. You know, at the time that they put this highlight package together, they didn't know that it was going to result in a four-game suspension. But you right. can see him go, and he went really low. He grabbed him, like, below the knees. He wrapped his arms around his mm. uh, his legs, or around his knees or a little bit lower, and just kind of pushed him into the ground. And you, you saw him, you, know, you saw the quarterback, uh, 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 Mazzoli, being helped off the field by Man. some of his teammates. And, and now they're saying, you know, he, he might have to have some knee surgery and uh, could be 10 to 12 yeah, weeks. 10 to 12 weeks is back. a long wow. time. That's pretty much the, almost the rest of the season. Yeah. I mean, yeah. unless Ottawa can somehow get into the playoffs. At this point, yeah. yeah. I mean, what, they're, they're four or five weeks in. It's an 18-game yeah. season. So, uh, yeah. his, his season may be over because of this. And that's be. very unfortunate because I like Masoli. I'm not saying yeah. he's the greatest CFL he's, quarterback, he's but, he, co- but he's put up some highlights. Year in and year out. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, that's why Ottawa went and got him and, Boy, that one hurts. So uh, speedy recovery to him, and uh, we'll see what happens with uh, Marino's suspension and if the Players Association does anything to prevent that from happening. Yeah. All right, and then moving on, we had one last game during the CFL Week 5, and that was Saturday night where the defending Grey Cup champions – excuse me, the defending (laughs) two-time Grey Cup champion Winnipeg Blue Bombers defeated the British Columbia Lions 43-22. This was a battle of unbeaten teams, and – the best highlights of the weekend, even yeah. even though uh, Winnipeg won by a couple of touch, you know, three touchdowns, right? Uh, it was still a heck of a highlight. Yeah, package. I mean, like I said, great great highlights on both sides of the of the game, and uh, you'll you'll read some of those highlights in a minute. But yeah. I actually watched this game. This was Saturday night. And, I caught a lot of the highlights. Uh, so. CFL was was on. I watched the whole game live, and uh, uh, this this was a good game, even though you know it it wasn't as close as a lot of people wanted it to be. You right. know. The, the young quarterback there, uh, Nathan Rourke, you know, he's he's been 3-0, and 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 everybody thinks that he's, you know, going to be really good this year. But he ran up against a buzzsaw in the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, and they just they just showed that you may be good, but you're not there yet. Yeah, kid. and in oh, British gosh. Columbia, uh, the two of the three previous games, I want to say, because uh, they were only they were what three and zero going into this game. Yep. So, um, they they blew out their opponents quite a bit. Hmm. You know, they beat. Uh, Toronto pretty handily, yeah, and they beat yeah. Edmonton pretty handily. Um, so going into this, I was looking for British Columbia to put up a fight, and I mean they, like I said, they can maybe hang with them, but they can't get down by twenty points or whatever it was, right. like they did in this game. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, I think this would have been a closer game. But let's get on with some of the highlights from the game as Winnipeg wide receiver Janarian Grant took the opening kickoff and returned it ninety-seven yards for the touchdown. And it was essentially from that point on that Winnipeg yeah. never looked back. Like yep. I said, they jumped out to a big 24 nothing lead yep. uh, before the Lions finally began to get on the scoreboard. So if you imagine not having that happen at the beginning of the game, how close right. this game could have been. Right, yeah. So British Columbia's got a team. They just got to they gotta make sure they don't let those big plays happen. Yeah. Um, but the Lions finally got on the scoreboard in the second quarter on a 66-yard pass from Nathan Rourke to wide receiver Josh Pearson. That was a thing of beauty. Yeah, check out. That I think highlight. I saw that play. Oh, that, that was, was just great. A bomb to the end zone. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, great, great highlight there. And then the Winnipeg defense con- uh, contributed three interceptions, a fumble recovery, and a sack during the game. So uh, best highlights the, of the week. They're the champions for name. a reason, the defending champs for a reason, and why they should be the title favorites this year. They've clearly, I thought maybe this would be a team that could be. Or British Columbia could have been the team to maybe take down right. Winnipeg, and they could be. They could still somewhere be somewhere down the line, but it's just a little too early in the season. A little too early, yet. but you know, as of right now, I think you're. If we were to do World of Football Canadian Power Rankings, <laughs> Winnipeg's still at the top. Oh yeah, no, so, no, no doubt. No about doubt. It. They've shown it already with yep. a four and over. And then on by this past week, Toronto, Hamilton, and Montreal all on by. Um, and then what other news of note from the CFL before we move into the standings? Montreal Alouettes uh, relieved head coach 
uh, Kari Jones and defensive coordinator Baron Miles of their coaching duties after a 1-3 and three start. Alouette's general manager, Danny Masiosi. Masiosa? Masiosia is Masiosia. the way I'm pronouncing it. I haven't heard anybody pronounce it, so by the spelling, I'm going to say Masiosia. I apologize if that's not the correct I'm sure if we got any Alouette's fans out there, they will <laughs> yeah. correct us. Cause, yes. Uh, I'm not sure if that's a French last name or where that uh, last name originates, but... I'm going to guess so, yeah. Definitely never seen a last name like that, and we don't want to say it wrong. So, Masiosia. I'm going to have to say that ten times fast. He's taking over as a head coach. Yeah, so that's weird. A general manager taking over as a head coach. That's a very odd, odd decision. Sounds like something Jerry Jones would do. He'd fire his coach and then go in and start... But I want that. I want to see Jerry Jones just go down in a blaze of (laughs) just embarrassment. (laughs) Gosh, I want to see that so bad. Yeah. Well, we'll, uh, we'll see. Maybe it's only for a game or two until they can get a new coach. In. I don't know. We'll who, see. Who knows? I doubt it. But we move on to the CFL standings, and uh, we're just going to blaze through the East standings because, <laughs> boy, boy, what a dumpster fire this oh, whole man. division is that, right now. That's a sad sight. As your number one team in the East is the Toronto Argonauts with a 1-2 and two record, Woo-hoo! followed by the Montreal Alouettes with a 1-3 and three record, yes. and then the winless Ottawa Red Blacks and Hamilton Tiger Cats at 0-4 apiece. That oh, is boy. your East. <laughs> but the West is a different story because we still have two unbeaten teams. We have the Winnipeg Blue Bombers now at 5-0 and oh to start the season, and the Calgary Stampeders at 4-0. and oh. So good for them, two great teams, and then the Saskatchewan Rough Riders at four and one, the British Columbia Lions at three and one, and then the lowly Edmonton Elks at one and four. And now we're wondering if the West wants to trade the Edmonton Elks over to the East. Because <laughs> for what they don't want anybody in return. It's not a trade; they're just, just going to give them. Bring to in them. the Atlantic Schooners. <laughs> Let's do it. I've been waiting for years for the Atlantic Schooners. All right, and that'll be it for the CFL, everybody. And we're going to move on to the Indoor Football League, where it was week 18 in that league, and next week, I believe, is uh, yes. the final week of the regular final season. Final week of the regular season for the IFL next week. Yep, and then we'll be talking playoffs. But yep. we, we do have some playoff clinching scenarios, uh, or at least uh, division scenarios here we're going to talk about in a little bit. But we had six games on Saturday and then one Sunday game this past week in the IFL. On Saturday, the Sioux Falls Storm uh, got by the Green Bay Blizzard 50-42. to the Frisco Fires uh, got by the Quad City Steam Wheelers 50 to 44. The Massachusetts Pirates, the defending champions, uh, defeated the Bay Area Panthers 44 to 28. The Iowa Barnstormers took out the Tucson Sugar Skulls 61 to 48. The Northern Arizona Wranglers got back on top with a win over the Bismarck Bucks 46 to 21. The Duke City Gladiators got a two point victory over the San Diego Strike Force uh, 53 to 51. And then on Sunday, the Arizona Rattlers defeated the Vegas Nighthawks 49-31 to to clinch the number one seed in the West for those Rattlers. After, yeah. boy, oh boy, for a few weeks, we thought the Wranglers might uh, be able to snatch that. Yeah, it might, looked like they might wind up uh, in second place uh, in the yeah. West, but uh, nope, not, not this year. Yep, so that means that the Frisco Fighters now in the East, uh, clinching that division, sit at 13-2. The Massachusetts Pirates at ten and five, the Iowa Barnstormers at nine and six, the Sioux Falls Storm at eight and seven, the Quad City Steam Wheelers at eight and seven, the Green Bay Blizzard at six and ten, and then the Bismarck Bucks at the bottom with a thirteen and sorry, a three and thirteen record. In the West, the Arizona Rattlers clinching that division with a thirteen and three record. The Northern Arizona Wranglers with a twelve and three record in second place. The Tucson Sugar Skulls, the only other team above five hundred with an eight and seven record to be the mm. third team in the in the West. The Duke City Gladiators with a seven and eight record. The Vegas Nighthawks at six and ten. San Diego Strike Force at three and twelve. And then the Bay Area Panthers at one and fourteen. And with that, we're going to throw it over to Randy with the National Arena League scores. Yeah, this was Week Twelve in the National Arena League. Uh, there were only two games this week. Uh, on Friday night, it was the Columbus Lions over the San Antonio Gunslingers by the score of get this seventy nine. To 75. I caught the highlight. You, of that, you the pointed of that this game. out to me as soon as the, that uh, score was posted. There were posted. seconds left, and the, uh, the the Lions were able to score a touchdown with three seconds, I think, remaining in the game. <laughs> wow. Yeah, to take the lead there. So yeah, that's been San what Antonio's, a game that could have been. Yeah. That's been San Antonio's uh, mo all season long. They played really well, yeah. and they just come up a little bit short yep. uh, at the end of the game. So you know, here they're they're playing well, but uh, another loss for them. Man, yeah. So and then on Saturday night, it was the Jacksonville Sharks defeating the Carolina Cobras 63-26, to which left uh, two teams on by this week, the Albany Empire and the Orlando Predators. So looking at the National Arena League standings, you have the Carolina Cobras in first place with an 8-4 and record, the Jacksonville Sharks at 7-5, and 
the Albany Empire at 6-4, and four, Columbus Lions at 5-5, five and five, and then the San Antonio Gunslingers and the Orlando Predators tied for last place with 3-7 and seven records. Now, I learned about this uh, this past weekend. Uh, you know, we, we haven't really followed uh, the women's football this season, but uh, I did see that their uh, championship games were going to be at Tom Benson Stadium oh. in Canton at the Pro Football Hall of Fame, which is where we were two weeks ago. Great place to have games. Yep, and uh, they actually had uh, three title games and an all-star game over last weekend. So on Saturday, they had their Division Three championship game, and it was the Oklahoma City Lady Force shutting out the Capital City Savages 25-0. to And then also on Saturday, it was the Division II championship game. The Mile High Blaze squeaked by the Derby City Dynamite 21-20. to And then on Sunday, they had an all-star game, and the national team defeated the American team by the score of 14-12. to I think that game kicked off at 9 o'clock in the morning. Wow. Uh, so that was a really early game. And then in the afternoon, early afternoon game, it was the uh, Women's Football Association championship game in their pro division, which is their top division. It was the Boston Renegades defeating the Minnesota Vixen 32-12. to This was the fourth straight WFA title for Boston and their second straight undefeated season. Wow. Uh, you know, there was a documentary about them yeah. on uh, uh, NFL Network. I think NFL Films uh, produced it. Yeah. But uh, it's been on NFL Network a few times, talking about uh, the Boston Renegades from a few years ago. Yeah. And, man, they, they have not lost a step uh, the whole time. And, you know, they followed some of the players, you know, the the quarterback. Uh, they I called it the name. Tom Brady of, uh, yeah. of uh, the Women's League. And, and a, a, couple, a year or so ago during the pandemic, uh, Robert Kraft loaned them uh, his jet, yeah. the, the uh, uh, Patriots player jet. I remember us doing and that he, story. And he sent them to Canton on the jet. And I think he did the same thing again this year. Hmm. Uh, they, they loaded up his jet and, and they took him to Canton for the championship game. So, uh, yeah, if you see that documentary on uh, NFL Network, uh, take the time to watch that. That was uh, really fascinating. Uh, and uh, I, I looked this up. There are actually right now 61 WFA teams across the country. There are 11 teams in the pro division, which is their top division. And uh, one of those uh, teams includes the Detroit Venom, which I've never seen the Venom play. I've seen several teams in this league play before because we used to have a team uh, in Kalamazoo, but uh, not anymore. So then the next one is the Division Two. There are 12 teams in that. And then there is a Division Three. There are 28 teams in that, including a team called the Grand Rapids Tidal Waves, which I didn't even know they were out there. Hmm. You know, I, I feel bad that I didn't know they were there and, and didn't get up to Grand Rapids to, to check out a game. I may have to do that next year if they're still around. Uh, like I said, we used to have a team here in Kalamazoo called the West Michigan Mayhem, and we'd, we'd gone to see several games yeah. that they played and uh, always had a good time. I remember seeing the Fort Wayne Flash. That was a team, and they had a woman uh, as a uh, mascot dressed up like the Flash. Hmm. And uh, uh, so you know, it was just, just a lot of fun. Uh, fun to w- go watch uh, football in the summertime in Kalamazoo. That, that was a good time. So congratulations to all the winners. Uh, the Mile High Blaze, the o- Oklahoma City Lady Force, and, of course, the Boston Renegades, your three champions in the Women's Football Association for this year. And that's it for the World of Football scoreboard this week. You'd think that things would be winding down, but you think. You know, we keep finding more and more stuff uh, yeah. going on. So let's get into some news. We'll start out with uh, NFL news. And the big story this past week was Carolina Panthers uh, – have acquired the former number one overall pick in the draft, quarterback Baker Mayfield from the Cleveland Browns, for a 2024 conditional fifth-round draft pick. Uh, If Baker plays 70% of the snaps, that could wind up being a fourth-round pick. So uh, that's kind of an incentive thing on whether it's going to be a fourth or fifth-round pick. Uh, The Browns will be paying Baker Mayfield $10.5 million of of the $18.86 million contract that he's owed from them. And the Panthers are going to pay an additional $4.85 million towards the contract. Now, the remaining $3.45 million is going to be tied to incentives in his yeah. contract. So, you know, if he, if he plays so many snaps, if he throws so many touchdowns, if he gets him into the playoffs, you know, those are all incentives that he could make up that, uh, that extra $3 million. So um, he it was a no-lose situation for him. He's still going to get all of his money pretty much uh, right. um, by making this trade. So, yeah, he's, he's now out of town and... And he, I guess he had his uh, uh, press conference today. Yeah, he had his press conference today. I didn't see it. I heard it was going on, but I didn't yeah, see it. I didn't watch it live either. I think I saw some highlights from it. Uh, I, 
anytime a quarterback can, you know, or a player gets a, a move to a new team, you kind of feel good for him because, like, hey, it's new, fresh, you know, so maybe something that this guy needs. Because Baker, while I thought he was an okay quarterback, maybe not great, mm-hmm. maybe he did just need a change of scenery from that that organization. Yeah, you can't, you, you never know. It's been a mess over there. And then on top of it, now the Panthers have both the number one and number three pick from that draft class where Baker oh, Mayfield, really? you know, was taken number one overall. And then um, Sam, Sam Darnold Sam was Darnold. taken, I believe. Or was he the number two overall? But I think maybe he's number three overall that draft. I can't remember. But now you got two of the top right. quarterbacks from that draft class on the same team. So, so I guess they're going to be competing for the Yeah, they'll the be competing spot. against each other. Hmm. So that'll be interesting. And then also with the Panthers hosting or playing the Browns week one, Yeah. Uh, the, the meme went around, of course, that the Browns are paying $588,000 to – baker mayfield to beat them that week <laughs> yeah the panthers will host the browns in week one so yeah. uh it'll be a home game for baker and we'll see what he well, wouldn't it be so that baker actually right gets quarterback number one you know if he gets the top of the depth chart and that is him going to that game mm. that's going to be crazy who yeah I, that'd be the game of the week I that think. might be a, you know we did our list of well when you weren't here aaron and i did like our games we were looking forward to the most this would sneak into my top 10 list if, oh yeah uh, if I hadn't already known that, so yeah, so so that should be interesting and exciting. Uh, like I said, but Baker's he's got to prove that he's the number one there. Otherwise, it'll be Sam Darnold starting for the Panthers. So yeah. well, that that Thursday night game between the Bills and the Rams, you know, we've been talking about that. We can't wait to see that game. And now Th- this will uh, be must watch TV. Yeah, Carolina if and, and Baker, Cleveland. Yeah, depending on who's, if Baker is the who's starter. gonna be who's gonna be the quarterback for the Browns. We don't know. They might, not even tell anybody till, they might not even tell anybody till right before that game. <laughs> yeah. So it'll be interesting. Uh, man, what a mess. Yeah. Okay, let's move on. Uh, the Las Vegas Raiders have hired the first black woman team president, Sandra Douglas Morgan. She graduated from the University of Las Vegas, and her resume is an impressive one. It includes being the North Las Vegas City Attorney, a chairperson of the Nevada, Nevada Gaming Control Board, an independent director for Allegiant Airlines, uh, Caesars Entertainment, and Fidelity National Financial Incorporated. That is a heck of a resume. It's a heck of a resume. But I mean, does that does that uh, transfer to football? I mean, she's obviously you know good with money, good with numbers. Uh, you know, maybe that's what the team needs. Maybe you know, she might be exactly what that team needs. Could and, be uh, a, a new perspective. A lot of success for her. But somebody's got you know uh, experience doing a bunch of different stuff. You know, maybe that's exactly what you need to uh, to find success and and for to see what they can do with the Raiders. I, I'm very interested to see. We probably won't feel any effects of this. Obviously, it's weird right. doing this like right in the middle of the like training camp season. Like we're about to get training camps started up and mm-hmm. all that. So I don't, I, I don't know if there'll really be an impact now, but it'll be interesting to watch as the season goes along. What kind of stuff happens mm-hmm. in the Raiders front office? You know. Yeah. Um. So, I'll yeah. tell you one thing: they've been bad with money. I mean, you gave <laughs> one coach a ten-year, hundred million dollar contract. Look how that worked out. Yeah. Uh, maybe. She's there to just kind of finally like let's be smart about how we're spending our money. Yeah, maybe that's all you need is somebody who's who can at least point you in that right direction. You know, start from there and work. You know, you yeah, would think trickle down. Uh, yeah, who's not ethics. spending? Who's not spending the money? Uh, you know, uh, with with emotion. Yeah, you know, she might she might be that calming influence that says, you know what. This is a bad move. I think if we went this route, it would be better for us in the long run. And what's great is this isn't. A, you know, like a move for history's sake, you know, oh, the first. Right. Well, you know, you know they keep making a big deal out of big, it. it. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. I mean, but, but it, it is. still is. It is. But I think on top of it, what makes this uh, uh, interesting is that it, I think it is a genuine, impressive hire. Look at that resume. She's got a stacked resume. She deserves to probably at least get a shot at this job. So mm-hmm. she's got it, and let's see what she does. But this is all – anybody who's got a resume like this – should be able to at least be considered and then hopefully maybe get that job. And it, clearly she did She did that. She's got the mm-hmm. resume. She obviously impressed in whatever interview. I, I would hope, you know, I don't, obviously we're not in the room. I would hope it's not because she's, you know, mm-hmm. she would be the first woman, the first, you know, African-American. Uh, right. You know, team president. Team president. So I'm hoping that, you know, I would just be like, I look at these credentials and be like, that's enough for me. Yeah. I'm hoping that the other side of that, you know, 
didn't wasn't the factor too but hopefully they looked at this resume and said this is the person qualified for this job and that is how every hiring (laughs) in the nfl or any business should be it should be about what you see on that resume not the gender or the identity of that person sitting across from you did you uh, did you see a picture of her yeah she looks like she's 22 years old. She looks young. She looks very young to she be a, young, a but, team president. But hey. I, and they didn't mention her age, which yeah, is probably I appropriate. I don't even they, want to guess how old a lady is. I'm not about to do but that. But she does look very, very young. But I'm not going to hold that against her. There's no. a lot of young, smart no. people well, out she's there. She's done a lot. If phobie. she's only 22, she's done a lot in her, in her 22 yes, years. Yes, she has. I have no idea how old but she is. But hey, good for them and good yeah. for her. And I wish her nothing but the best, you know, with that organization. Right. And, and she's a lifelong uh, Las Vegas uh, resident. I think she's born and raised there. Like I said, she went to college there, and, and she's worked there. So, you know, she's she's not going anywhere. That might be another strength to having her there, yeah. you know. Yeah, she's not, I don't think she's going to jump to another team uh, for more money. It's, you know, she's a Las Vegas person. So, you know, that's her team. All right, let's move on to another story. Former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice has joined the ownership group of the Denver Broncos. Uh, She served on the inaugural college football playoff selection committee a few years ago. And uh, once I remember her saying that she wanted to be the commissioner of the NFL because she loves football. Hey, I mean, is this a first step towards that? She, she (laughs) has built a quite the football resume. Um, Whether or not, I still don't know if she's, I won't say she lacks football IQ. Mm. She was on the college football committee. Right. For whatever that's worth. I mean, well, she's a, I guess she's a huge fan and, we're huge fans. Doesn't mean we need to be on the board, but I'm not saying she's not a smart person. She's done a lot in you know government and politics, mm-hmm. so you have to have some sort of acumen for doing that. So transitioning now into you know the college football playoff, and then turning that into now ownership with the team, I think it would be harder to go from owner of one, a part owner of one team, to a commissioner of the league. I feel like that'd be a conflict of interest at some point. Well, but you, obviously you would have to renown, you know, or get rid of your ownership stake or whatever. Probably, yeah. Because you were technically working for the owners at that point right. being a commissioner. But right. I wouldn't object to it. This is, I think she's building up a resume, but you would, I, I don't even know. I don't, I don't know if, this, if that's <laughs> yeah. a transition I don't know that if could that's, happen. If that's really what she wants to do in the future is be commissioner of the NFL. But, but would it make me mad if, I, if that happened? I wouldn't be upset. I'd probably be like, know. this is a bizarre decision, but let's see what happens. I'm yeah. not about not, you know, I, I'd see where it goes. The owners are going to pick somebody that yeah. uh, that they want and that they know that they can, you know, manipulate like Roger Goodell, whatever. Uh, so who knows? Uh, you know, it, to me, commissioner of the NFL is a job I wouldn't want. Like I wouldn't want to be president of the United States either just mm. because there's too much hassle, too much BS, too much backfighting and all this. So, you know, I wouldn't want to be commissioner of the NFL. I feel NFL. like on paper being commissioner of the NFL, I mean, as a commissioner of my own fantasy football league, <laughs> it, defi- <laughs> it definitely has its uh, headaches. As, oh, yeah, that's really similar. Hey, I, can, I can see where you're I've spent highly all qualified. Day, hold on. That. I have spent all day today for my fantasy football league uh, texting everybody, trying to make sure we got people coming back. We have one person not coming back. So now as commissioner, I have to find a 10th team to replace in our league. So, you know. I get it. The stresses of being the president of the United States, of the <sighs> NFL, or you know, commissioner of the NFL, or commissioner of my fantasy football league. I mean, the pressures are real, Randy. <laughs> you you would not know these pressures. No, because I don't do fantasy football, and uh, hopefully never will. Okay, <clears throat> let's <laughs> let's move on. Uh, we're talking about the commissioner of the NFL. That that rolls right into our history lesson, which is coming up here in a, in a few minutes. So oh, but, all this but, ties in. Well, guess what? We're not running into the history lesson now, are we? No, but uh, it's coming up here uh, in a little bit. Uh, another story from this week on the NFL. Uh, is there the possibility of a roof being put on Soldier Field in Chicago? Uh, the Chicago mayor... Hold on. What does this have to do with the commissioner? Nothing. We we've moved on. I think you could you could have transitioned that Stay into the next the... story after it. Man, you're terrible at this what? segue thing. Well, because the next story is about the uh, NFL Sunday ticket. Yeah, but the commissioner's plan about that. See, that's where. Wow, no. I, I had to teach you this on air, but that's where. That's where the commissioner would come in, you know, and you do that transition. Well, but and stop knocking your camera around. We got yeah, cameras sorry, in I hit here. The, I hit the camera with my foot. Um, let's see. All right, let's let's move ahead one. Uh, the NFL. No, go ahead. No, go with your crappy transition. Oh, you rotten son of a gun. <sighs> no, you made your crappy the transition. The Chicago mayor you lie in it. wants to keep the Bears downtown and keep them from moving to the suburbs. That's why she's suggesting uh, the feasibility, you know, to look into putting a roof on Soldier Field. Um, 
this might help Chicago get a Super Bowl you know, sometime in the future, and the facility could be used for other things, you know, in the winter, like Ford Field is, you know, truck pulls or concerts or whatever. So you've got you've got your two schools of thought. You know, there's some fans that want that don't want a roof on it because they want that home field advantage. You know, like Green Bay and Buffalo. You know, they want that. You know, they want teams from Miami and California coming to their stadium in December and having to deal with the snow and the cold and the wind, and it plays right into their hands. You know, they're used to it, so that's that's a big advantage right there. But then, you know, like in Detroit, you know, I appreciate going to a game in December in Detroit and having it 70 degrees inside a Ford Field. Uh, you know, I appreciate having a roof, and I kind of think that all the northern teams should have a roof on their stadium. But, mm. you know... They they're never going to put a roof on uh, Lambeau Field, even though when it uh, you know when it was first built, they were talking about putting a roof on it back in the fifties, hmm. uh, late fifties, I think. So um, who knows? But I, I don't know. I I can't see it happening. I think historic Soldier Field is one of those stadiums that will never ever 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 have a roof put on it. But well, I don't know if it's but, so historic anymore the way they've uh, well, upgraded it a few years maybe, ago. Maybe maybe not. I haven't been it's in not there. The same. I've never, yeah, been, I've to never been there. I would like to go to I'd love to go to Soldier Field. But I think if they're building a new stadium, then that's maybe where you get into yeah, let's throw a roof on this puppy. But mm. I don't know. As long as it is technically Soldier Field, I don't think they're going to do it. Well, you know, unless, they, you, unless they want to do like a retractable thing to where, yes, you know what, yes. you know what, Chicago Bears, if you want to have the stadium open for your winter games for some reason, go for it. But in the winter, we want it close. We can have Taylor Swift show up and play a concert, <laughs> so we can have your tractor pulls or whatever it was you were talking about. Right, yeah, monster so, trucks. Yeah, so, so yeah, yeah. I think retractable roofs are great. I'm. I wish. I Ford wish more Field stadiums had, had them. A, I would love a, it if, the, if Ford Field roof. had a retractable. Yes. Roof. Because there's some early season games when it's beautiful out yeah. there, and you know it'd be great to have the sun shining in and and uh, feel the feel the wind in your hair as opposed to being inside, uh, you know, in a, in a dome stadium. Or if but, or if for some reason the Lions are hosting Matt Stafford and the Rams in a <laughs> NFC Championship game, and you're like, you know what, we need home field advantage. Keep that roof open. <laughs> we're gonna let eight feet of snow in here, and we're gonna try to win this thing. I don't know about that. I know that that's all a big. Pipe yeah. dream, <laughs> but but that is something that the mayor of Chicago is proposing. Is so uh, you know what would it take to put a roof on this place and and uh, you know make it make it better. Good luck and, getting and, through and Mike keep, Ditka. That and ain't keep ever the happening. Team, keep the team downtown and keep them from moving to the suburbs. All right. Then the other story that you wanted me to to do was the NFL I'm just Sunday. That would make picket. the more logical sense transition wise, but you failed to do. I so. put them down in the order they appear during the week. But so. okay, but we've podcast for 251 episodes now. I've done 252, so I have a little extra experience than you do in terms of oh, yeah, transitioning. Big experience. Hey, that one episode <laughs> is a lot. Can I continue? You can do it on the fly. I'm just saying. Continue. The NFL Sunday ticket is going to be moving to a streaming service in 2023. This is the last season that it will be available on Direct TV. Apple TV, Disney, and Amazon have all made bids for it, but uh, even Goodell came out and confirmed that yes, it. it the Sunday ticket package is moving to a streaming service next year. So uh, I know for years a lot of people went with DirecTV just because they wanted that Sunday ticket. They wanted to be able to watch their, you know, if they're retirees out in Arizona, they wanted to watch the Lions or the Packers or whoever, you know, but they don't live in that state anymore, but that's always been their team, and they wanted to get all those games out there in Arizona or California or Florida, wherever they're retired to. So, um, you know, it, it made sense, but now... Uh, I think if it's not going to be on DirecTV, you may see a lot of people jumping off of DirecTV. Oh, and, and I think that's a foregone conclusion, that. especially jumping to an Apple TV, which I think is a great service. Jumping to a Disney Plus would be weird, but any of these streaming services or an Amazon that's already doing the Thursday night games, I'm all for it. Like, I could be anywhere and not miss a Lions game now. Mm. I can literally have the Sunday ticket, you know, pay whatever, however much a year for Sunday ticket, and if I'm somewhere that just so happens not to be in front of a TV, I could pull my phone out mm. and stream the game right then and there. Like, that would be great. I mean, you can do it with some games with certain, you know, like Yahoo or the NFL app. You can stream a couple of games, but mm -hmm. not – I want the full slate. Like, if I want to jump around and I've been hearing, like, you hear this Steelers-Bears game is, you know, uh, going into overtime and it's like 63 to 63. I, I want to flip over to that, but when you got it on cable or satellite or whatever, mm. like – Good luck finding that game because you yeah. only get a couple games. But it, it, with the ticket, you can get every game. 
Well, the thing with the ticket uh, up until like last year, I think it was, you know, you, you pay for that package and you get every game, yeah. you know, every Sunday. But I think last year they changed it to where if you wanted to just buy one team's package, if you didn't want to pay for everything, but you wanted that one yeah. team, be it the Cowboys, be it the Patriots, yeah, I'm the sure Lions, with, a street, or, with a streaming service, Minnesota. that model could be the same. They're, they could even tweak it a little bit. Right. Maybe you get uh, different tiers. Like, hey, you get all the... NFC Central, your, your division or games, or you get all of the NFC games, or you get you can maybe pick a, a few teams. Like, hey, for this price, you can pick five teams and you get every single one of their games, mm, yep. or you can get the whole league for this price. Right. So, like, I'm sure they will. They will do everything to suck every single penny <laughs> out of us consumers, and to have as many uh, subscribers as possible. And I'm sure it will work. And yeah, and especially so with weird. the ease of streaming now, where everybody's streaming everything, everybody's got a Netflix, everybody's got a Disney Plus, everybody's got an Amazon Prime account. Somewhere, some way, people are going to be watching this game anywhere. And shoot, you will see. And I get, get, I guarantee you, you will be at a Lions game or you will be at some other football game. People are going to be sitting in the stands watching five different games in front of you. They're all going to have their phones out watching different games at the uh, same time because that. because of fantasy football. Oh God. Tell me I'm wrong. Everything I hate, fantasy football, watching other teams. No, uh, I'm sorry. That's that's just not me. But, yeah, you're probably right. Oh, yeah, what? what was that? Can I get I, that in writing? I said probably. Oh. You're probably right. All right. Uh, the Pro Football Hall of Fame uh, came out with a list of 54 semifinalists for the Hall of Fame class of 2023. Uh, just a few names that I jotted down. Shannon Sharp, which... What am I always saying? The people on TV are going to be the first ones to get voted in, so he's he'll Excuse get me. in because it's been, he's on, it's been the case. He's lately, on TV the last ten years. Uh, Billy White Shoes Johnson is on this list, uh, which is cool. I like one of the best like nicknames his. in yep. football history. Yep. Uh, Detroit Lions head coach Buddy Parker, the, hmm. the man who led the Lions to those uh, four title games in the fifties, um, you know, and winning three out of four. Uh, he's on this list. Uh, let's see who else do I have down here? Ralph Hay. The owner of the Canton Bulldogs, and you know, it was in Ralph Hayes' Hupmobile dealership in Canton, where the owners all got together and they formed the NFL. You know, and they have a Ralph Hay Award uh, in the NFL, but he's not in the Hall of Fame. So I think they're trying to rectify that. So uh, Ralph Hay is on the list. Clark Shaughnessy, uh, who you may not be familiar with, but he was the creator of the modern T formation that everybody uses now. Before that, it was the the single wing and the double wing. And, uh, you know, he come along and, and helped the Bears uh, develop the, the T formation. And that's why they beat Washington, what was it, 73 to nothing in the yeah. NFL championship game? That was Clark Shaughnessy's uh, offense that did that. So, you know, uh, several names on the list here that uh, I think are great. If you want to see the complete list, uh, I posted the article which came from the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Uh, it's on our Twitter feed, or you can go to the Hall of Fame website and check it out there, too. Sorry, I keep k- kicking the camera. Good Lord, it's like you've never filmed uh, on a podcast before. Yeah, well, I just, uh, my feet are in the wrong place today, I guess. Yeah, maybe you should stay away from the camera. Okay. Jeez. Uh, let's see. Uh, Pittsburgh, the Pittsburgh Steelers Stadium, Heinz Field, as it's known, will or be was known. will be renamed Acrisure Stadium. Boy, that just rolls off the tongue, Ugh. doesn't it? Acrisure Stadium beginning this season. So they're probably right now taking down the Heinz Field signs. Uh, taking down those ketchup bottles. Putting up the Acrisure logo or whatever that looks like. What I didn't realize was that this is a Michigan-based uh, insurance company. Oh, is it Michigan-based? It is from I, Grand Rapids. I ha- Well, I, I saw something about Grand Rapids. I didn't know if that was that where, is where they're based from. Based from, okay. Which is really so odd I, to I me. I saw that it was an insurance company because I had no idea what Acrisure was. But, yeah, it's an insurance company. And I guess they've signed a 15-year deal with the team for uh, stadium naming rights. But uh, terms of the financial agreement were not released, so we don't Mm -hmm. know how much they're paying over the course of 15 years or if there are options for more years to extend it. Uh, The stadium had been named Heinz Field since it opened in 2001, so this is only the second name change. I hate these corporate names on stadiums. I really do. I mean, Ford Field, yes, is a corporate name, but it's also the family name of the family that right. owns the team. So I can kind of agree with that because, you know, Ford family, Ford Field. Like, what what happened to the, like, even Mercedes-Benz Superdome or whatever it is now, uh, at least it's the Superdome. You can, like, cut off the corporate sponsorship. Like, Heinz Field never had a, a name. It was never right. Steeler Stadium or something. Before that, it was Three River Stadium because it was... 
in a part of that, Pittsburgh where three rivers that's all what come every together. stadium needs. There should be a proper name for the stadium. And then on top of it, add your spots. Like, it's like right. University of Phoenix Stadium turned into whatever, State Farm, whatever the heck yeah, it's called now. Yeah, they change every few years. Yeah, I hate that. They're like, no. Candlestick like, Park became something else, some corporate name. Levi Stadium. Yeah. Or I, I don't know. I can't keep track of them all. Well, I Levi just, Stadium is, the new, I think, the newly built yeah, stadium. Yeah, the new one. But, 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 yeah, Candlestick Park did for, get a corporate name. But any of these new stadiums one. getting built, you know, SoFi Stadium. No, 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 come on, guy. Like, why do we go right off the bat with a corporate sponsor? Like, give it a cool name first. Give it a name that could be associated with uh, – the stadium and then throw the corporate sponsorship on top of it and you still get that like mm-hmm. it should be accu whatever accu uh pittsburgh pittsburgh stadium. stadium yeah or something like that but no the yeah now it's gonna be confusing in a couple of years because now that that one thing i bought you of all the stadiums oh that yeah you, the you stadiums i've off, been to yeah now i gotta get a new one because heinz field is no longer a thing yeah so yeah i hate this i'll still scratch it off if i go there yeah um, let's see. Let's be, oh, uh, the other story that uh, came out just a little while ago, the Houston Texans yes. unveiled a, a an alternate uh, helmet color. I thought this, this was fake. Season. I thought this was, I saw Adam Schefter uh, <laughs> post this. I definitely thought this was fake because it looked like a fan made just slapping a Texans logo on like a, a shiny red college helmet. And I was mm. like, ew, what the heck is this thing? And it turns out it was real. It's their battle red alternate helmet for the texans this year hmm. whatever i think it looks hideous <laughs> i don't like it at all it's uh, not that bad it, it's i mean maybe once i see it on the field yeah it, you know it'll be fine but i think they're gonna wear this during their november 3rd game which i think is against the falcons i want to say hmm. i could be wrong about that but you know so this is the third or fourth alternate helmet we've finally gotten since the uh, helmet change rule uh, Falcons, obviously, are going to go with some throwback. Yep. Uh, the Patriots, Patriots uh, are going to yep. wear the white yep. helmet that we all know and love. The yep. Saints added that black helmet we talked about a couple weeks ago. Yep. And then maybe the Eagles are supposed to have a black helmet. We haven't seen anything official about that. But, then, mm. of course, one thing I always keep forgetting, the Washington Commanders already have the alternate black helmet mm. uh, that they've shown off. So yep. that's five teams right there, six teams now, including the Texans, that yep. will have alternate helmets for this season, it looks mm. like. So... Yeah, they're piling on. Yeah, will there be more? Who knows? I bet you. It seems like we're getting one a week. One every couple <laughs> weeks now, teams yeah. are finally coming out with these yeah. alternate helmets. But how much thought went into this? I mean, if you're sitting there at the Texans office putting you know equipment together, like, what could we slap this Texans logo on? Huh. How about just this shiny red helmet? Good enough for us. It's like no thought goes into some of these alternate helmets. At least like the Falcons and the Patriots have history. Those are the old school helmets. And I get it. The Texans are only a 22-year franchise. Right. So they don't really have that. So this right. is their first alternate helmet since they, when they first got announced as a franchise and they had the logo on the white helmet. Right. Then they did the Navy or the, yeah, yeah the Navy And everybody helmet. assumed that that was the helmet. It was going to be a white helmet yeah. with their Texans logo. But, you know, that, that didn't even last maybe six months no. after they debuted that and, and showed the logo that, that they, you know, switched to a blue helmet. Yeah. So, I don't know. I mean, so for the Texans, I guess, you know, it's not really a slap in the face if you're a Texas fan because it's not part of the history. Now yeah. it is. Now it'll be your second helmet ever, which mm-hmm. is interesting. But I just don't – that red just doesn't work for the Texans for me. Hmm. That's just me as a helmet uniform snob, but yeah. whatever. Okay, we're going to move on to some CFL news uh, as if we haven't had enough CFL news already. Uh, I thought this was a really cool story when I saw this yesterday. The Edmonton Elks will have the first ever game broadcast by indigenous announcers. Windspeaker Media will broadcast the Elks' July 22nd game versus Winnipeg in the Cree language. Cree, huh? Yeah, there was this a... this the, the blue people from the Marvel movies? No, no. Uh, they, they had a, a name for the tribe, and I, I wasn't even going to attempt to pronounce it, but in parentheses they put Cree, so that's mm, what I'm going okay. with. Cree language. Uh, the broadcast uh, will be carried throughout the province of Alberta via two Windspeaker Media radio stations, CFWE-FM in Edmonton and CJWE-FM in Calgary. And... Uh, I think this would be kind of cool to listen to. So if if you're wanting to see what uh, this uh, indigenous language broadcast is going to sound like, we have uh, links to both of those radio stations in the article that I posted on our Twitter feed. 
Um, and so, you know, you could click on the link on game day and uh, maybe hear some of that broadcast. I think it'd be interesting because I, I love when they do like the Super Bowl and they'll they'll show a little bit of the Spanish language. Right. Uh, or French. Or they, they, right. they hop all around the world and show the right. different you languages. Know, and, like somebody scores a touchdown. Well, let's hear what the Spanish version sounded like of that last touchdown. And they'll go and they'll you hear the announcers, you know, just going crazy and they're just babbling along. You can't understand a word they're saying, but you Unless you, get you speak the that language. It. Right, right. <laughs> Which uh, I don't. I was going to say, like, don't, don't say they're babbling along, right? It's somebody's language. Yeah, right? somebody understands them, but I don't. To me, it's babble. But, uh, yeah, I just wow. I think that would be pretty pretty cool to, to just hear a few minutes of that Anytime uh, broadcast. something like this comes out, I love hearing, you know, a new language getting, mm-hmm. you know, some... It's, it's always cool to, to hear that. I, I forget when, one of the last ones we heard where they were going to do something in a language that we weren't familiar with. Like, oh, that's cool that they're going to do that. Or, like, I, I remember there's a story about a movie coming out where they're going to... Uh, dub the whole movie in this uh, Native American language. Mm. Uh, even though it's an English-speaking movie, they're going to dub it in this Native American language because it's actually Native Americans in the movie. So mm-hmm. that's really cool. And I like hearing stuff like that. And and I think I'd love to see more of this. And especially up in Winnipeg, I'm surprised... Or not Winnipeg, yeah, in uh, Edmonton. I'm surprised it is uh, taking this long to do something like this. Well, you know, uh, up until last year, uh, the team was known as the Edmonton Eskimos, which was considered uh, by many indigenous folks up there a derogatory name right. so now that they've changed it now they're that embracing the that team makes sense. that's a valid they're, point they're embracing the team as the elks and in fact this particular game on what was it july 22nd is known as the indigenous celebration game oh, okay. uh, so you know to go along with that so you know uh, will this uh, will these broadcasts become uh uh standard you know are they going to broadcast every game i don't know maybe they'll do one or two a year but i just think it's really cool that they're doing this and uh you know obviously the the team and the uh, indigenous folks up there have finally you know uh, uh come to an agreement with one another and uh, no hard feelings and now they're uh, uh going to embrace the game and uh, everybody's happy <laughs> i guess <laughs> I, I don't know but i just i think this is a cool idea and i i was really happy when i saw this so i'm, I'm looking forward to Hopefully checking out a few minutes at least of the of the broadcast on one of the radio stations. Okay, uh, moving on to a little bit of USFL news. The championship game that we were at just uh, last week averaged 1.5 million viewers on Fox. And the broadcast peaked at 1.8 million viewers late in the game, which is pretty good. Yeah. And uh, but, but still, I have not seen any announcement on the actual Special attendance attendance. at the game. Yeah, they've never put that anywhere. Um, yeah, and I got thinking about this. You know, it holds 23,000. We thought that it probably, you know, they probably had 20,000 there. I thought 19 to 20,000. It, it might right. be a little lower because you remember they had the end zones blocked off, those the seating oh, areas. That's true, yeah. So so yeah, they didn't have all the seats available. So it probably the capacity for that game was probably, you know, maybe 18, 19, so might have been a few thousand less than that, but boy, it sure looked full yeah. for for the seats that were available for everybody to sit at. Uh, I thought it was really, really well attended, and uh, you know, great experience. So I'm I'm glad we went, and uh, uh, that was always going to be a great memory uh, of going to that USFL championship game. All right, some college news: Aloha Stadium is going to be torn down. We kind of knew this was going to happen. Uh, it's been sitting vacant for several years. Uh, it hosted 35 Pro Bowls over the year, over the years, and that was always one of my bucket list things: was to go to a Pro Bowl in Hawaii and sit there in the stands and watch the game. That's why you and, can't put this stuff off, man? Uh, I know. I always wanted to do that and never did. You know, uh, your mom and I went to Hawaii on our honeymoon uh, many, many years ago, and, and you made and, the uh, mistake of not getting married around Pro Bowl time. No, <laughs> you know. But uh, we were on a tour bus uh, in Hawaii, and we were driving from one place to another. I think we were going to uh, Pearl Harbor for a tour that day but we did get to see the stadium from a distance it was like you know uh, the biggest thing in town (laughs) Uh, so it was very visible from our bus so that's as close as I ever got to Aloha Stadium but yeah I I will always be disappointed that I didn't actually go to see a Pro Bowl game there I always thought that would be a great idea you know get get out of Michigan in in January or or February and and go to Hawaii and take in a football game that would have been great so anyway, it, the stadium is expected to be demolished either in late 2023 or early 2024 with a new stadium put in place by the end of 2025. So yeah, by 2025, the Pro Bowl will probably be a thing of the past, so it'll never yeah. <laughs> never host a Pro Bowl again. But um, 
It still might be good for you know going out there for Western a going college, to Hawaii college Please game. And thank you. Oh, absolutely! If the, if that happened, I would be there. <laughs> I would absolutely be there. And a story that you brought to my attention this this week: the Chick Fil A Peach Bowl is sold out already. Hold on, checks calendar. It, it's July, yeah. and a January bowl game has already sold out. Yep, yeah, uh, because it's going to be one of the semifinal college football playoff games uh, venue this year. So uh, that kind of makes sense. But still, wouldn't you want to know who's in it or who might be in it before right. you actually... Uh, evidently, actually, December 31st people don't care. They would just want to go to the semifinal game and be there no matter who's going to be there. I guess. But, man, wouldn't you kind of want to know? I would. And, and if you're the... Maybe by selling, they still are holding off, like, a certain amount, even though they're saying sold, mm-hmm. for teams that, you know... The fan bases that make it to the game, obviously. Right, yeah, because you, yeah, whatever team gets there, you know, they get so many, and the other school gets so many for their followers and fans and whatever. So I don't know, but anyway, uh, the game is going to be played on December thirty first, and this is the earliest sellout in the game's fifty four year history. Obviously, uh, I don't think the Peach Bowl has been a, a semifinal. Uh, uh, college it might football. have been. They they've rotated that so much. I can't keep track. Yeah. It's so different every year. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Peach Bowl sold out already. Uh, what is it, July? 12th? Well, today is July twelfth. Twelfth. But this yeah. story came out what, like a day or so ago? A few days ago. Yeah. Okay. Um, Arena Football TV on YouTube. The game that they posted this week was from two thousand four. The Arizona Rattlers at the Las Vegas Gladiators, and our friend Clint Dolzell was the quarterback of the Las Vegas team during that game. So. Um, that would be a good one to watch. Uh, see him uh, play in Las Vegas a few years after he won his Arena Bowl in Grand Rapids. I think this was his first season in Las Vegas, too. I think it was, yes. yes. All right, today's birthdays, July 12th. Former NFL running back LaShawn McCoy turns 34 years old today. He played college football at the University of Pittsburgh. He was selected in the second round of the 2009 NFL Draft by the Philadelphia Eagles. He played 12 NFL seasons. He was with the Eagles from 2009 to 2014. He was with the Bills from 2015 to 2018. He was with the Chiefs in 2019 and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in 2020. And those last two teams, uh, when he was with those two teams, he won back-to-back Super Bowls, one with Kansas City in 2019 and one with Tampa Bay in 2020. So what a way to end his career. Uh, A couple of one-year stops with new teams and gets a Super Bowl ring because of it. So. Happy birthday, LaShawn McCoy. All right, we have some obituaries this week. I don't think we had any last week. And then as soon as our podcast was over, man, the obituaries started popping up on my feeds all over the place. So we actually have uh, five of them this week to talk about. And I'll start here. Uh, This is where we take a moment to honor those who made the world of football a better place. The first one today is that of Jimmy Williams, a defensive back in the NFL for six seasons. He's passed away at the young age of 43. There was no cause of death given uh, right now, so we may hear more on this some other time. Williams played college football at Vanderbilt and was selected in the sixth round of the 2001 NFL Draft by the Buffalo Bills. However, he did not play for the Bills. Instead, he wound up signing with the San Francisco 49ers, where he played from 2001 to 2004. He finished his playing career with the Seattle Seahawks in 2005 and 2006. He was a team captain with the Seahawks, when they lost to the Pittsburgh Steelers in Super Bowl Forty in Detroit. All right, our next obituary, oh, excuse me, is that of Jim Van Pelt, who played quarterback in the Canadian Football League for two seasons and has passed away at the age of 86. Van Pelt played college football at Michigan and was selected in the fifth round of the 1958 NFL Draft by the Washington Redskins. However, he chose to sign with the CFL's Winnipeg Blue Bombers. He led the team to back-to-back great up great cup championships in 1958 and 1959 and was named the mvp of the 1958 great cup game in his rookie season his playing career came to an end in 1960 when he was drafted into the u.s air force yeah yeah getting drafted again and uh uh, this time it was the air force not another team uh let's see here uh john watson an offensive lineman in the nfl for nine seasons has passed away at the age of 73 Watson played college football at Oklahoma and was selected in the seventh round of the 1971 NFL Draft by the San Francisco 49ers. He played for the 49ers from 1971 to 1976, and he finished his playing career with the New Orleans Saints from 1977 to 1979. Our next obituary is that of Claire Branch, a halfback 
fullback and linebacker in the Canadian Football League for six seasons, has passed away at the age of 85. Branch played college football at the University of Texas. He signed with the Saskatchewan Rough Riders and played for the team from 1960 to 1963. He was then traded during the season to the Edmonton Eskimos, where he finished his playing career from 1963 to 1965. Another obituary is that of Gary Moeller, head coach in college and in the NFL, has passed away at the age of 81. Moeller played college football at Ohio State and got his start in coaching as an assistant coach at Miami of Ohio in 1967 and 1968. He then became an assistant coach at Michigan from 1969 to 1976. After that, he was the head coach at Illinois from 1977 to 1979. He returned to Michigan as an assistant coach in 1980, and he took over for Wolverines head coach. Uh, took over as the Wolverines head coach in 1990, 1990 after Bo Schembechler retired. So they replaced Bo with Mo. I remember, you know, Bo Schembechler. Bo Schembechler used to have Bo on his headset, and uh, when uh, Moeller took over, he had Mo on his headset. Uh, I do remember that very plainly. Uh, he served as the head coach of Michigan through 1994. Moeller then moved to the NFL, first as an assistant with the Cincinnati Bengals in 1995 and 1996, and then with the Detroit Lions from 1997 to 2000. When Detroit Lions head coach Bobby Ross suddenly resigned during the 2000 season, Moeller became the interim head coach and went on to lead the team to a 4-3 and record in the last seven games of the season. Detroit ended the season with a 9-7 and record and just missed out on the playoffs. Moeller finished his coaching career as an assistant coach with the Jacksonville Jaguars in 2000 and with the Chicago Bears in 2002 and 2003. And you probably remember this. Well, know, he when, was with Jacksonville in 2001, I just want to say. You just said 2000. So. Oh, I'm sorry, 2001. But, yeah, you remember when Moeller got uh, uh Yeah, we were excited. Him. Didn't it, they start? Weren't he, they red hot for a while? He did. You know, he, like I said, he, they were 4-3. and three, They were close to making the playoffs. And everybody thought that he was going to come back the following year. But what happens? Uh, they they hired um, Marty Morningwig. Mar, well, Marty Morningwig and uh, Matt Millen. Uh, Matt Millen, the GM. Don't even, why are we going? This decided. Uh, yeah, this is we, a family program. We don't, we don't need uh, Gary Moeller. We want Marty Morningwig. So, yeah. and that was just uh, one of the many. That was the beginning of the end of the, the Lions downfall. Franchise. <laughs> Another downward turn for the Lions. As oh, if yeah. that last second field goal that beat us from going to the playoffs uh, the, didn't hurt the, enough. The Bears. Yep. A, yeah. Oh gosh. Bad times for Lions fans back I'm getting then. flashbacks. All right, <laughs> moving on. Our final obituary that uh, this week is that of Bob Parsons, a tight end and punter in the NFL and the USFL, has passed away at the age of 72. Parsons played college football at Penn State and was selected in the fifth round of the 1972 NFL draft by the Chicago Bears. He played for the Bears for 12 seasons from 1972 to 1983. Parsons finished his playing career with the Birmingham Stallions of the USFL in 1984 and 1985. No relation to this year's Birmingham yeah. Stallions. Yeah, we may have to start saying the original USFL when we talk about guys that played in the 80s as opposed yeah. to guys that, you know, years from now they'll say, oh, he played for the USFL back in, you know, uh, 2022. And they'll think, oh, that was the only USFL there ever was. But no, it's... Uh, uh, 1.0, USFL 1.0. Yeah, what, yeah, we'll have to find some way of distinguishing one from the other. Okay, uh, any other uh, There is no breaking, breaking news. Breaking there news. is nothing new. We are going really long this week. Okay. Uh, so Let's move along. What here. is your history lesson about this, this week? This week's history lesson tells the story of the only NFL c- commissioner who ever actually played pro football. In the early days of the NFL, there was no commissioner. Instead there was an NFL president. The position of commissioner came about in 1941, and since then, five men have held that post. But only one man who has been commissioner has ever actually played professional football. The first NFL president was Jim Thorpe in 1920. At the time, he was playing for the Canton Bulldogs. He was selected more for his name recognition than for his ability to run an entire pro football league. Next came President Joe F. Carr from 1921 to 1939. He built the NFL into a strong organization with his passion for the game, his sense of fair play, 
and a policy of strict adherence to the rules. The third and final NFL president was Carl Stork from 1939 to 1941. The first true NFL commissioner was Elmer Layden. He served from 1941 to 1946. Layden played college football at Notre Dame and was a member of the famed Four Horsemen of Notre Dame backfield in 1924 under head coach Newt Rockney. He went on to play fullback for three seasons in pro football before going into coaching. He played for the NFL Hartford Blues in 1925, the American Football League's Brooklyn Horsemen in 1926, and the NFL Rock Island Independence in 1927. The Brooklyn Horsemen were part of a rival pro football league to the NFL. It was started by Red Grange and his agent, C.C. Pyle, after George Hallis refused to give Grange and Pyle a part ownership in the Chicago Bears after Grange's rookie season with the Bears in 1925. The Brooklyn Horsemen played only six games in the AFL before they withdrew from the league on November 12, 1926. The team then merged with the Brooklyn Lions of the NFL. The NFL team was then renamed the Brooklyn Horsemen, played its first NFL game on November 22, 1926, finished out the NFL season, and then folded. They lost their last three games, all by shutouts. The team was called the Horsemen because it featured not one, but two former members of the Four Horsemen backfield, Layden and quarterback Harry Stuhldreher. Layden went on to be the head coach at Notre Dame from 1934 to 1940 before becoming the NFL's first commissioner in 1941. None of the commissioners who came after Layden ever played pro football. Not Burt Bell, or Paul Tagliabue, or Pete Rozelle, or current NFL commissioner Roger Goodell. No, the only NFL commissioner to ever play pro football was the very first one, Elmer Layden. One. One commissioner, that's it? Yeah. That's unbelievable to me. You'd think there'd be some other former players that would have gotten this chance, but now they're just a bunch of pencil uh, pocket protector <laughs> nerds that end up being commissioner. Well, you know, before the commissioner, they had the president, like I said in, in this history lesson, and, and the first president was Jim Thorpe, who was also a player, but that was more name recognition than anything. He, he did nothing as NFL president. They just wanted his name to be associated with their new league to get him off the ground. But uh, when, you, when you consider right now, uh, up in the CFL, their current commissioner, Randy Ambrosi, uh, actually played nine seasons in the league as a guard and a tackle. Uh, he was with Toronto and Calgary and Edmonton between 1985 and 1993. So, you know, at least up there they have a commissioner who understands what the players are going through. You know, he may be a little more sympathetic. I know a lot of people don't like him up there. They don't think he's a good commissioner. I don't seem to have a problem with him, but I'm not there every day you're reading not Canadian. papers. You're yeah. not allowed to have a problem with him. Yeah, but but I just I think that that's a good idea. You know, I think we should have a commissioner who's actually been a player. Uh, he'll understand. But that, boy, but that also creates some more conflict, I think, just because of the Players Association. Like, mm. And this guy's supposed to work for the owners. That's like having one of your coworkers become your boss, but he's still mm. got to answer to the other bosses. But yeah. he's he knows where you guys are coming from. That's just what a weird spot to put somebody in. So it's – I don't even know if there's a perfect way to get a, a commissioner, to be know. honest with you. Yeah, but, but I do think it – Condoleezza it's, Rice, you're up. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Perfect segue, segue there or callback. All right, let's go. Yes, uh, that's a callback, not a segue. Yeah. You're welcome. Upcoming events calendar. Thursday, August 4th, the Pro Football Hall of Fame game in Canton, Ohio. The Jacksonville Jaguars versus the Las Vegas Raiders. Tuesday, August 9th, Major League Football's inaugural season begins. Or will it? Yeah, and I did see a thing where they're actually beginning to sell tickets at Tom Benson Stadium mm. for the uh, Canton team. I forget what their name is. But, yeah, they're going to have a team that's going to be playing their home games in Tom Benson Stadium there next to the Hall of Fame. And those tickets are already going on sale. So um, I guess they're actually going to play they're, with their four-team league. No idea how many games they're going to be playing right now. But, you know, maybe I'll look into tickets and see, you know, how many home games they're going to have. Let's and see if this that. league lasts first before yeah, we'll, we get to that point. We'll see. We'll see. And then uh, lastly on our upcoming events calendar, Thursday, September 8th, the NFL regular season begins with the Buffalo Bills at the Los Angeles Rams. Should we add that uh, 
that game two days, uh, three days later, that Sunday game with uh, uh, the, the, Panthers the Panthers hosting the Browns, Browns. <laughs> as another no. upcoming event? <laughs> no, but it is definitely uh, moving up my radar. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's possible that uh, Deshaun Watson and Baker Mayfield won't even be the two quarterbacks on the field that day. So it'll be, you know, uh, a nothing game, really. It could be Sam Darnold and just whoever a, yeah, the Browns just another, to, And Jacoby Brissett, the other quarterback. Just another game in the NFL. It could be, but we'll see. I'm I'm pulling for Baker get, to get sure. the starting job, sure. but then I feel bad for Sam Darnold because you know he left New York, and we were saying the same thing last year. Like, hey, get a fresh start in a new place, and then <laughs> he's one year there, and now he's got Baker Mayfield, the guy who got drafted before him in the yeah. draft. <laughs> so, yeah, what, a uh, weird, what a situation this weird is. Weird situation going on down here. All right, uh, last last call. Anything on your phone? No breaking news as of now, but as always, something will break as soon as we turn the microphones right. and Absolutely cameras correct. off. Well, that's all the time we've got for this week. If you learned something during this podcast about the incredible amount of diversity that exists in the world of football, then we've done our job. Visit our website at theworldoffootball.com for news, links, upcoming events, videos, and more. Our email address is info at theworldoffootball.com. You can also like The World of Football on Facebook at TWOF Kalamazoo. You can also follow us on Twitter. The address there is at TWOF Kalamazoo. New episodes of this podcast are posted on Tuesdays and are available on SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and YouTube. Our YouTube channel is The World of Football Kalamazoo. Uh, we posted a video that... Uh, uh, was a highlight from last week's podcast. If you haven't gotten a chance to go check that out yet, uh, just uh, an excerpt from last week's show about our trip to Canton with some actual, I'd say, home footage, uh, home video, but yeah. uh, footage we actually took ourselves. A few pictures uh, at the and game, videos, we took. videos we took at the game, some pictures. So we incorporated that with some of the highlights from the game, and uh, just talked about our experience going to that USFL championship game last week. So yep. go over to the YouTube channel, check that out, where you can go and subscribe rate review give us a like on the page it means a lot leave a comment uh, let us know what you think and please come be a part of the football conversation and remember folks some people may love football more than we do but nobody and i mean nobody loves more football than we do until next time i'm randy snow and i have no quips this is like the second or third week in a row i got no quips i ain't got nothing for the end of the show yeah you've spoken too many words already this week so I guess you don't need to. Well. <laughs> we'll see you all next week.